Before we begin, we want to take a moment to thank our sponsors at Audible. Now that the weather's getting nicer, I'm back to reading and listening to books in the park. And with Audible, it's never been easier. Every month, I get one credit to pick any title, plus two Audible originals from a monthly selection. In addition, I get access to news digests from the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and the Washington Post. If you go to audibletrial.com slash ymopodcast, you'll get two free audiobooks on us. Download thousands of titles offline anytime, anywhere. Having trouble deciding what to pick? Audible lets you keep your credits for up to a year. Find your summer read and support your favorite National Film Registry podcast. Once again, that's audibletrial.com slash ymopodcast. Thank you for your support. And now, on with the show. Gentlemen, if you could get one more movie from a star who died too soon, who would it be? Uh, it's pretty simple for my generation i mean it's gotta be it's it's heath ledger i mean the guy you know kicked off such a kicked out at such a young age i mean and to go out on the joker is truly just one of those like kind of like what james dean did just dropping the mic with such an iconic performance that is kind of annoyingly still affecting us to this day with people trying to outdo him to the point where Joaquin Phoenix did it to get an Oscar and look at that it worked I mean uh I, I can only imagine what that guy would have done after doing that I mean he had such a big impact when he started with like 10 things I hate about you but then he started showing his range and doing serious stuff and broke back mountain was like a big moment for him and then the dark knight was one of them yeah, I mean, what like what that guy like, you know, with a PTA or, you know, working with the Coens or something or like getting to work with Quentin or, you know, I mean, this guy should have like, you know, he could have done something with Spielberg or something. I mean, I, I really wish this guy was still kicking. I mean, we would have been, we'd be now in his middle age at this point and seeing what he would be doing as an uh, as an older gent being a dad and all that and uh yeah i really wish keith ledger was still kicking so yeah that's my my pick for me it's somebody that maybe a lot of our listeners don't think of as an actor but um if i could get one more acting performance it would be i, I would love it is um is elvis presley elvis presley um did act in plenty of films um we get to cover one eventually on the show in jailhouse rock but in Jailhouse Rock and then later uh, King Creole, which is a more dramatic film, you get to see Elvis start to show some dramatic chops, and it's the kind of thing that he wanted to pursue. He did want to do more dramatic roles. He wanted to do more daring roles. Of course, Colonel Tom Parker kept him making, um, let's just be blunt, crap, like Girl Happy and Kissin' Cousins and, and Harem Scarum. Elvis's last movie is in 1969, Change of Habit with Mary Tyler Moore. Uh, and then after that, he only has two other films that are both concert films. And the bummer of it is that I just keep thinking about what he could have done in the ensuing decade. He dies in 1977, and I just keep thinking about, I mean, apparently uh, they Streisand had approached him to be the Christofferson role in A Star is Born, but I think at that point he couldn't take it. And I just keep thinking about, like, somebody like Elvis the iconography he represented and everything. Old Man Elvis um, put in a film by a, a Spielberg or a Scorsese or all of these guys who grew up with him and what he represented, now getting to play with that iconography the same way that like Robert Mitchum got a Friends of Eddie Coyle or something like that. Uh, I think would be fascinating, or, or God help us, if he had lived, <laughs> some, you know, made it all the way to when a Quentin Tarantino was making movies, or somebody like that who loves reclaiming older stars. I just keep thinking that that Elvis stops making movies in 1969, dies less than a decade later, but stops making movies right at a time where people finally would have been able to give him the kind of roles that he would have done something really interesting, uh, really interesting in. So. Uh, yeah, I would have loved to have gotten one more film role out of Elvis. Every year since 1989, the Library of Congress has selected 25 films to add to the National Film Registry. 
the criteria, the films must be culturally, historically, or aesthetically significant. Each week on You're Missing Out, we take a look at one of these films to try and get to the heart of why they were selected and why they still matter. This week, we're tackling generational tensions and teenage angst. Blank Check producer Ben Hosley joins us for 1950's Rebel Without a Cause. Our guest today is a producer for Blank Check, the podcast, and is the founder and CEO of the Congratulations fashion brand. Uh, Ben Hosley joins us today to talk about Rebel Without a Cause. Ben, thank you so much for joining. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We're excited to have you, man. Thank you for coming. Absolutely. I don't consider myself a rebel per se. I think that's quite a lofty title (laughs) to sort of you know, put on oneself, but I do consider myself at least a a, a true admirer and appreciator of scumbummery and just bad behavior in general. (laughs) Well, that's what I'm so excited for. You know, we're, we're big fans of uh, your show blank check and we're big fans of, of what you've brought to it. I think that um, truly uh, what, what you have done on that show over the last six, seven years, the show has been going now, something like that, right? Seven years Seven now. years, yeah. yes. Crazy. Uh, what you've been doing over the last seven years really kind of speaks to something that we had been talking about from the beginning of our show, which is the idea of uh, that I think too often people kind of look at film as either like a thing that you obsess over and talk about shot choices and all this stuff, or you're a person who just goes, I don't know, I I like movies. And what's great is when that show, when Blank Check started, you would, you know, sometimes watch the films that, that uh, past guests of the show, David Sims and and, and Griffin Newman had, had um, watched, you'd watch along with them and occasionally throw in like a, you know, a joking commentary, but kind of take this approach early on of, yeah, you know, whatever, I'm not one of these movie people. And then as the show has gone on, you've really, uh, with full sincerity, you know, infused your point of view on these movies and talked about what spoke to you about them. And, you know, you uh, recently on the West Side Story episode had a a, a lot to say about the uh, the depiction of the juvenile delinquents and, as you put it, scumbum aspects of that film. And, and, and seeing that grow, I think, is something that for us doing a show that's kind of all about helping people understand why these classic films are considered classic. It's, it's been great to kind of see you bring that other point of view to these movies. I think it's been really great for all of us. Oh man, Mike, that's so sweet. Thank you. Yes. With, with blank check, I for sure like have over time kind of become more and more of like someone who's on mic, more of like a personality on the show. And it's so fun for me. I mean, what the seven years of this show has brought into my life is basically I have to constantly watch movies. Now you're also correct too. I wasn't like a uh, cinephile when I started the show and I don't still consider myself one at all, but I have a lot of fun with getting to sort of bring, I think someone who is, I guess like, I don't love when people call me the voice of like, like a blue collar voice necessarily. I mean, but you know, I, I think I just, I like to bring sort of a, a self-awareness in that I'm not this huge fan and that I, uh, and that I also just kind of like to have fun and have fun with even just commentary as far as just picking out things that to me, uh, bones, chains, which chains, I mean, chains are in this movie. We're going to talk about it. Um, Oh yes. Yeah. I just, I, you know, I just, I, I, I really enjoy getting to kind of uh, play around specifically in film criticism and commentary. It's, it's great. Well, you know, that's kind of the thing I think a lot of people tend to forget about movies is is that you're supposed to sit down and enjoy them. And uh, not to say David and Griffin don't enjoy the movies they watch or have fun on the show, but they they are coming from a place where it's got to be, oh, well, we got to think about everything where you come and say, well, yeah, but like, guys, there were chains in here. (laughs) Right. And And also, come on, there's nothing more simple than even just like, like think about the day of someone picked that chain out 
and brought it to set. You know yes. what I mean? Like that to me, I don't even get that far into it usually, but just that, like, to, that's so beautiful. Like, wow. Well, and it's, you know, the way that you talked about, and particularly on, on your recent film, you know, or recent episode on West Side Story, um, I think that that is a movie that can kind of, or that story and that, that plot can kind of get bogged down in when people are watching it. You know, occasionally I'll make a crack on Twitter about um, what I describe as the the sensitive Connecticut boy critic or somebody who just like when they're watching a movie that deals with, with street gangs or anything like that, or even just the suburbs, takes sort of an approach of like, ah, the quiet dignity of the pause and that kind of thing. But like when you talk about growing up in Jersey and the, and the, and the porch movies, as you describe them, and like Tom and I are, are from Long Island, right? We're from suburban Long Island. We were not going to the film forum when we were six years old or anything like that. Like we have, totally. when you talk about watching Steven Seagal oh. movies on cable, like that's our introduction to this. And you know, oh, that's, that yeah. was us. My, my life, my life, it, it, every time you tell a story about your youth or whatever, or like watching movies on the porch or whatnot, or like you said, the Seagal stuff, or like Clifford or whatever, you know, <laughs> that was more my experience growing up. So I think, you know, again, it's just movies, you know, there's more to, I don't know. Sometimes it's just, I don't know, you got to have a different perspective. And I, 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 I just got to be honest, like the second you logged into this chat and I just heard your voice say hi, I was just like, hell yeah, there he is, my guy, <laughs> yeah. Ben Hosley, the fucking right dirt on. bike Benny. Love it. That's right. That's right. Um, I'm not doing the whole spiel. Don't worry. Yeah, I'm not an actor, so I don't have it memorized. We don't have that, that in us. Uh, no. God, yeah. <laughs> but it's, it, but it, the, the important thing to me and the thing that I find so striking is that yeah, that's how you came to movies and came to appreciate movies, kind of similar to how we grew up with that, but that you then take that point of view and that perspective and bring that to watching The Piano or watching some of these films that other people who maybe view themselves as a genre person or a B-movie person maybe doesn't explore, and I think that's so great. Yo, it's okay to not know about stuff. Exactly. Which is like and a huge motto for me, just kind of in general. It's like, don't pretend to know about stuff just because you're afraid that people then are going to look down upon you. Like, you know, if you didn't have access to the film forum and TBS was your like access to, to movies, like at the end of the day, it's moving pictures and stories and, you know, uh, yeah, I don't know. Right on. I'm, I'm totally though. I'm with you guys. And I also, I wanted to say, if I could compliment concept of this show, and I think it's it's a cool sort of similar vibe to Blank Check, where I feel like you guys are being positive with your your viewpoint, and like you should check this stuff out. Thank you. I, I really that that Thank means you a lot. Much. Thank yeah. you. That's You're welcome. you know, it's for us. It's and that's why I'm so glad to have you. You know, and and to talk about this film in particular is it's all about. This, this this should be a resource for people who maybe if they do watch whatever movie is considered a classic uh, and they don't get it, instead of going, well, everybody else must be dumb, like, let's let's try and help people find that. I mean, in the case of what we're here to talk about today, Rebel Without a Cause, you know, I mean, there it, it, I, it's possible that somebody watches this and goes, I don't know, it's hokey or it's this and that. But, I mean, this movie in particular is in the DNA of so many movies going forward so without further ado before we talk about what we like about rebel without a cause let's talk about what the national film registry had to say this is what the library of congress had to say about rebel without a cause this portrait of youthful alienation spoke to a whole generation and remains wrenchingly powerful despite some dated elements the yearning for self-esteem the parental conflict the comfort found in friendships all beautifully orchestrated by director Nicholas Ray, screenwriter Stuart Stern, and a fine cast. This was James Dean's defining performance and an impressive showing for Sal Mineo. That is all the Library of Congress had to say. Whoever wrote this, I guess, had a problem with Natalie Wood. Not sure why she doesn't get a shout out there, but you know so what? We're going to roll with it. Did Rita Moreno write that? <laughs> I forgot about that. Uh, oh, man. But yeah, so that is what the National Film Registry had to say. Now, Ben, obviously, like you said up top, you uh, are a big advocate for the um, the scumbum films and, uh, and and juvenile delinquent films. And this is kind of the genesis point 
of the, I mean, especially this year is the genesis point of all of the juvenile delinquent movies that we get and this whole streak of like the youth gone bad. So I, I couldn't think of anybody better to have on. And also a shout out to Phil Iskove who uh, helped out and put us in touch to do this. Uh, very excited. We love Philip Iskove, don't we, we do. folks? We absolutely do. But uh, Ben, was this your first time watching Rebel Without a Cause or had you seen it before? I had watched it in high school, but since then it had been many years. Yeah. And what is your, in general, what are your thoughts or what was your relationship to James Dean? I know he's such he's such an iconic figure. I think we all know him even if we don't know his film. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, my relationship to him is more as just a cultural figure. And to be completely honest, I would say static images really more yeah. than actually seeing him move and talk. Well, that's that's fair because he kind of did only make three movies, so... Not a lot to right. see visually. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I knew he had a tiny, you know, barely any th- kind of career, but three. Wow, that's amazing. He had done a lot of TV stuff that kind of doesn't get talked about um, before the movies. In fact, there's an interesting one. I believe the title, I could be it's completely wrong. I believe the title is The Dark Dark Night or something like that. It was a one of those um, I forget the the kind of like those NBC um, movie of the week or whatever stage productions, and it's it's he plays a gang member whose buddy gets I think shot or stabbed. They go to the house of a local doctor, uh, and that doctor is played by that's right future president Ronald Reagan, and it is one of the weirdest things you will ever see in your life is James Dean and Ronald Reagan acting opposite each other. That is so. Um... Yeah, that is so, uh, <laughs> like, two cultural figures, like, or just, I mean, a president and this this huge, like, American figure, I, to see them next to each other, I I don't know if I'd be, is it worth watching, though? It's, TBH? it's, I would not say it's worth watching the entire thing, because you get tired of it, but it's worth watching a portion of it, especially because, you know, Reagan was, I want to, you know, he's a problematic fave, if you will, because I do enjoy watching Reagan as an actor. He's such a, he's an interesting presence, but he is a very like traditional old school actor where, you know, he's that Lawrence Olivier, dusty, it's called acting kind of attitude of just, I'll show up, I'll read the lines, I know how to make it sound. And then you have Dean, who is this very method, you know, actor doing these very weird choices and the two styles do not vibe. So th- this is kind of a case where you kind of have to say uh, wrong kid died. <laughs> no but like it is this thing it is this thing where like you're watching you do imagine that like backstage like reagan shows and goes well i'll help you i'll show you how to stitch him back up and then you've got dean doing like a oh doc I'm like, and you're like we, reagan must have been perplexed well just i'm just imagining if dean pulled the shit he would pull like making this movie or whatever where it's like up oh, dean's on the floor crying again uh we're, <laughs> we're rolling the film uh, how much film do we got left? Like five more minutes? Fuck. Uh, <laughs> hey, James, you want to get up? You want to get up? Okay, he's up. Great. Uh, we're going to get it. Oh, oh, he got it. Great. Oh, he stormed off to his trailer again, and he's crying, and uh, I don't know if we're going to see him the rest of the day. Fuck. Um, yeah. Well, at least we got that take. You know, <laughs> I wonder if they had that much patience on film or not, but uh, uh, not TV sets back then, but probably not, and I don't think Reagan had any uh, patience for that. Uh, that's probably why oh, he no. took it out on everybody in the 80s, you know? <laughs> that's it it yeah but it's so it, yeah so that is fascinating but yes he only made three movies uh this is the middle of those three dean had east of eden with uh which is an Ilya kazan directed film and then rebel without a cause and then which is uh, nicholas ray and then giant uh and i think east of eden and rebel without a cause are both 55 giant is 56 Dean is dead before Rebel Without a Cause or Giant even get released. Yeah, a month before Rebel Without a Cause comes out. So yeah. he only saw East of Eden get released, which is, you know, sad. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what it's else sad, to say, but it's sad. But his legacy is so hype because of it a little bit. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's definitely a bit of a... You kind of wonder if he would have ended up as much of an obnoxious, insane asshole like Brando did. Oh, yeah. Like, Totally. Like he like he would have got cast in like some Bogdanovich movie, but like he would have made Bogdanovich's life a living hell because he would have came in with like, oh, I shaved my head and like 
I started stapling my face. So I, I like look like a nut job. And Bogdanov is just like, this is a fucking musical in the thirties. What are you doing? <laughs> and I don't know, like it or probably it'd be like, it'd be like Kurt Cobain sur- lives. And instead now he's an old and he's making a movie where he goes to like a ha- haunted carnival. Like what are the Foo Fighters doing well, again? I can't well, remember. No, it's, it's more like Kurt Cobain lives and he's just Billy Corgan now. Exactly. Where you're right. just like, where somebody just goes, did you hear what Billy Corgan said? And I go, I truly don't want to. <laughs> There's no world where I'm going to be better from knowing. It's basically what happened if Morrison didn't, if, if Morrissey, as, seeing what happened when Morrissey escaped oh, the 80s. Yeah. Like yeah. if James Dean is basically if Morrissey didn't escape the 80s. <laughs> so maybe or, for the best, because uh, Dean didn't seem to be the most uh, balanced individual. Or who knows, you know, uh, his co-star in that TV movie, Ronald Reagan, when they made that, he was a Democrat who ran a union. So you never know where folks end up in decades later, you know? No, Uh, you don't. But (laughs) To go back to what you were saying before about just like him crying on set and, you know, being sort of just like, you know, constantly, I guess, in character, being, I guess, assumed method, like it brings to mind this exaggeration of the artist but of that era that to me is like hilarious <laughs> because it's like i don't know it, it's like um the beatnik yeah. kind of uh like time or coding of like how an artist should act um i bring this up because something i'd like to get to at some point in our discussion is we got to talk about bully behavior in this movie, Mm -hmm. talking about like just archetypal behavior because the, the, like the vibe of like being an artist in this era, you know, has always, it's changed, it's evolved. But to me, there's something about how basically bullies are the same, like West side story behavior, the recent film, you're seeing kind of the same bully type, behavior macho behavior that's also in this film yeah i and i think that's partly like part of what this movie touches on and and i i wouldn't argue that the 50s are the only time that america felt this but this is tapping into a real sense of of kind of what we called the lost generation you know the 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 beat poets you know kerouac and ginsburg and all that and this just general post-world war ii attitude of uh, just feeling like uh, you know nothing matters and 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 we're technically everything's provided for, but we don't know what to feel. I mean, you know, one of the things that I think is so poignant about this movie, this was when you know this is the same year as Blackboard Jungle, which is the other most famous uh, juvenile delinquent movie, right? Uh, Blackboard Jungle is the first movie to use rock and roll because uh, it features Rock Around the Clock. Also features a young Sidney Poitier, which is fascinating to see. Um, I'm sorry. It it features rock around the clock. Correct. Rock around the and clock. And this is a juvenile delinquent <laughs> film. Correct. It is. Correct? Well, it is. But it's worth noting that that film, Blackboard, these kids Jungle, and they're rocking around the clock. <laughs> it's um it, that one is about a teacher who go. You know, our main character is the teacher, and he goes back to the school, and he's trying to reach these kids, which is the thing we do a lot more often. You know, it's always focused on like how does the adult reach these youngins, um, mm. and it only opens and ends with Rock Around the Clock, I think, or maybe it plays at one point in the middle too. But but it was like groundbreaking at the time because it was featuring it, and if you watch this movie. Rock and roll is still so new that when the teenagers are listening to the radio, it's still like bebop, you know. Um, <laughs> now, which now is... I'm just imagining a modern day remake of Blackboard Jungle with a super sad Enya cover of Rock Around the Clock <laughs> in the trailer. To be like, see, we know our we know our heritage. We know that they used Rock Around the Clock. A24 presents Blackboard Jungle. Um, but yeah, there was a lot of them. Teenage Crime Wave, Running Wild. These are all like just the delinquent films of 55. Um, but the rest of them all kind of take this viewpoint of like, ah, the kids are crazy these days. Who knows why? Who's no, who knows what's gotten into these teens? And this movie is the only one that I think kind of tries to has tap an into. <laughs> yeah. Well, it has an answer. And also like a lot, <laughs> well, a lot the of answer. these delinquent movies 
uh, try like if you watch the older I'm, I was cause I was trying to think like are there earlier juvenile delinquent movies and there are in terms of like when you look at a lot of the 30s gangster movies from like Warner Brothers you get like Angels with Dirty Faces Dead End but in those cases your street gangs your your um you know as as Ben terms them uh, scum pum characters they make a point of like they ain't got no homes they ain't got no parents they ain't got a nickel to their name. And this movie, I think what's so interesting is it's like they have homes from the outside. They're all provided for. Plato's mom mails him checks all the time. You know, uh, none of their parents are, div- you know, like, they, you know, uh, Natalie Wood and, and James Dean's parents aren't split or anything like these are seemingly model homes. And yet, you know, they're they're uh, they're torn apart, these kids. And I think it's such an interesting and very empathetic kind of view. Yeah. I mean, it's it is interesting because I feel like, you know, when when it comes to historical context and all that, we don't really understand these days that like teenager wasn't really a thing for like the was, longest time. I was going to say, do you like do you guys have a sense? I mean, I have like I have so little grasp on the specifics of like fucking history. It's like embarrassing truly. And I'm just like, in my mind, though, I'm like, all right, you know, basically teenagers were invented when people didn't have to constantly work on farms, right? Essentially, yeah, right? Assen- like, what's the correlation? Assen- I, I, I don't essentially, know. Essentially, I think it's also kind of maybe a little bit of a, a sort of marketing thing of like, oh, well, we got these, this young group where they're they just hit 13 and they're not at work yet because they got to go to high school. How do we market shit to them? Oh, I know. It we'll always say comes back a specific to brands. Group. It kind of does in this goddamn country. Well, and there's but, uh, also... Apologies. Yeah. I'm sorry. I didn't no. mean to cut you off, Tom. No, please. No, no, it's totally fine. I just got heated. It's just like, it's like fucking brands, of course. That's the American dream, baby. Let Make sure a brand invents something for you. Well, oh, the brands are speaking for me now. Thank God I can be free knowing that they put a scene representing me that can be easily cut in China. Well, but it's also about like, it, it's more than just the, the brands or anything like that too. Because the other thing you have to remember is the last time America knew any kind of prosperity was the 20s, right? Because, yeah. you know, by the end of the 20s, uh, the depression is about to begin. We have the entire 1930s depression where... If you're a young person, if you're a young, able-bodied person, you're going to work. You're you are going to, work, going to yeah. a factory. You're getting married at like 16. You know, you're right. You're you don't have a chance at being a young adult because you're basically like, you know, uh, I mean, really, like, you know, oh, you're a man now means you're a fucking man. Go out and work. Um, and then the war happens where if you're 18 years old or even a little younger. You're going to the goddamn battlefield, right? Hell, 15-year-olds are fucking easily able to sneak into the war. So, exactly. So, you know, think about how many 15 to 19-year-olds got slaughtered in the war, you know, which just rewrites how people think about their children in, in terms of that as well. So then think about the fact that the teenagers we're looking at in the 50s are a psychologically scarred group because they were born into war, right? Anybody who was a teenager in 55... You are born during, you know, or in the immediate aftermath of the goddamn yeah. World War II. The, 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 these kids in this movie were like, they're like 15, 16. So they were two years old when we got into the war. Yeah. And then it's just like nonstop, like mayhem throughout their their youth. And then prosperity and our parents are coming, you know, our fathers are coming home from the war. And uh oh, seems like he's not in the best of moods today again. And everything's just kind of like it's supposed to be okay because the war's over and, you know, the country is booming with the economy. But well, there's something yeah. rotten in Denmark. Baby boomers, really, if you think about it, is basically just like our parents came home. All right. Really, our parents or grandparents, whatever. But they came home and they just smashed. Like, that's yeah. what that is. Yeah. Yeah. Like, and a whole generation of where everyone was just like, yeah, like away for so long that they were so they just had yeah. But then we factor went to hell. you know but then factor in like the baby boom, like the babies who we call the baby boomers are conceived during this post war period. 
the teenagers during this period, when the actual baby boomers are like, you know, uh, they're not teenagers does not just mean like, oh, you know, they're in between a child and adulthood. They're also in between the generation that went to war and the babies that are born into new suburban prosperity. And these are teenagers who are essentially being at, are being told like, hey, everything's good now. But also remember that only a couple years ago, we invented a thing that could wipe out all of civilization if we just drop a couple bombs. Also, we're going to war in Korea. Also, the commies are coming to get you. And you could die at any minute. So with all that going on, like you kind of understand why these kids turned out the way they did. And you have that great moment that I, I love. And, and uh, when I was thinking about this film, Ben, and some of the things you talked about in uh, when you talk about um, being a, uh, you know, a, a scum, you know, a, a scumbum kid and doing stuff to do stuff. There's that moment right before they have the, the chicky race, right? Mm-hmm. Where um, Jim is talking to Buzz and it's just the two of them. And Jim goes, you know, why do you do this? And Buzz goes, you got to do something. Yeah. And I thought, like, that's such a – that so captures that feeling, you know? Absolutely. It's, like, almost um, – it's not even inherent. It's, like, the cycle goes on for, like, the the legacy, the tradition, the ripple of that. Like, it's just human nature for whatever reason. Young men have to challenge each other in, like, ridiculous ways that could lead to one's perishing. And also, like, this feeling of, especially because, you know, we're post-war, but, you know, Korea's brewing and, and the Cold War is brewing and all that. There's this anxiety that kind of comes from, like, yeah, you know, seemingly on the outset, we've solved all our problems. Seemingly, there's prosperity. But that then means if you're feeling any tension, either because you're thinking, hey... The Soviet Union could drop bombs on us and kill us all, or I might get dragged to war, or all this could fall apart, or just stuff in your home life, like my dad won't talk to me anymore, or my parents are dysfunctional. You have a, a, a an apparatus in a world around you where all the adults are saying, why, you should be happy. You don't have any real problems. And so you all that anxiety builds up, that pressure builds up, and you've got to do something with it, you know? And and it's all and it's also again that thing of like they have nothing to do because they are they there is prosperity in these kids lives they don't have to work they have no responsibilities everything is ostensibly fine so they kind of just have nothing to do but sit around all day and fret about all the shit that makes them upset to the point where you know James Dean we open up with him crying on the, in the middle of the street playing with a discarded toy we find out that Plato's fucking shooting dogs because he's just so whacked out of his mind with with grief basically from his father abandoning him and his mother not giving a shit about him and then this girl again nothing else to do but well I guess I'll go with this guy who likes to play chicky with his car because, well, it makes me feel alive a little bit because my father doesn't want to look at me anymore. And it's all just, we got to fill the time. I mean, we see that shit today, you know, with all these, you know, in the suburbs and shit where kids are, you know, they're not drag racing or whatever, but they're fucking popping pills to just feel something. Oh, kids are drag racing. Oh, they absolutely too. are. They're doing. Oh, both. they are. I. Oh, I know they are. There's a strip. There's a strip right next to my house where we hear them drag racing every night. It's. I'm just saying say, in general. Tom, wasn't there? Wasn't there like a drag race that ended in airport plaza a couple years ago that made like national news? Listen, think, I'm just saying. In yeah, ge- no, I'm trying sorry. to just say it may not be as prevalent today because drag racing in today's cars look stupid as compared <laughs> to the cars back in the 50s. These stupid yeah. boxy little plastic toys we got, but. Also, yes, Ben's right. It is still happening, but it's also now happening with pills to make this slow, inevitable demise over the cliff feel yeah. even longer. Well, and there's also, like, remember that on top of that, like, this is the first generation that's starting to question their parents' rules, you know? Yes. And this happens a lot now. This is the, this is a cycle now, but, like, you know, th- you know, the 50s were all, I mean, we forget, like, from the parents' perspective, like, you know, we're all about rules of like, well, this is how to cut your hair. This is what kind of clothes you can wear. You can't wear blue jeans to school. You can't, you know, the dance, you got to leave six feet apart or wherever, all kinds of stuff. And you've got a generation of teenagers who are basically looking at this and going, well, why? And also, hey, 
why can't we hang out with the kids across town whose skin looks different than us? And, well, what's so wrong with us, you know, uh, necking in a car? And Like, there's all of these rules that they're starting to question, and I think part of that comes out of a sense of hopelessness, part of that comes out of a sense of complacency. So, it, it, long way around, you know, Ben, you're talking about, like, the, the, the birth of the teenager. You know, yes, hmm. it is studios and other corporations marketing to young people who now have disposable income, but there is also just this element of kind of what a lot of, I think, you know, people of, of our generation sort of felt post 9-11. And I think that the current generation is feeling kind of post 2016 or post COVID, which is, you know, this feeling of just like that, that when we were kids, there was prosperity to some degree. And, and now it's feeling like it's getting stripped away a bit. And now it's feeling like at any moment things could go to shit. There's not there's a clear, you know, line from something like this all the way to, you know, euphoria right now, right? You know, I think what is it, you know, Rue had a line about if I don't do drugs, what am I gonna do? Which is on yeah. par with Buzz saying, Well, we gotta do something, you know? Right on. Absolutely. Yeah, I had a similar thought where I was just like, Euphoria compared to this, like it's uh <laughs> how many years later now? What, seventy yeah. years between the two? Yeah, more or yeah, less. just about. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like uh, it, it, the two, uh, you know, uh, things have changed, and as far as depicting teens on screen. But at the same, yes. you know, and, they, and, I guess they are still Hollywood is still like whatever. If they're thirty six years old, they can <laughs> yeah. play sixteen. It doesn't matter, you know. Like, yeah, that's still going. I mean, if anything, we've weirdly circled back around in a way. <laughs> Where in the 50s, there was a lot of conversation at the studios going, well, you can't, I mean, you can't imply that, that Natalie Wood's character is having premarital relations. Oh, you can't imply, you know, and the Hays Code's still kind of going on at this point. And then, you know, I feel like we kind of got away from that and we, we circled back and we could get to the point where in the 90s, you know, Larry Clark and Harmony Corinne could make kids. And right. now I think 30 years after kids, uh, I imagine if 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 Twitter or Tumblr discovered kids now, there would be conniptions about some of the things that happen in that movie. Oh, I'm truly oh. imagining people who watch that fucking reality show, what that the talent show, what is it, Big Show, Big Top, what is it, Going Big Show, Go Big Show, yes, the Go Big Show, and people going, "Ooh, Rosario Dawson, what has she done?" <laughs> and going back to kids. I mean that that's got to be a great Friday night with the family. Well, like, just, just throwing on kids on the Criterion Channel. Yeah, you know, but also you know. it's funny too because these other than James Dean, like Natalie Wood and um, Sal Menio are actually like kind of the right age. Yeah, for this, and James Dean's only twenty four, even though he looks like a solid thirty seven. I mean, <laughs> it, it 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 is funny though that like five years later how long like west side story comes out natalie woods in that yeah and then she's probably the only one even close to the age she should be playing race not risk withstanding but then mm. everyone else around her is like 35 year old men that are just like yeah we're in high school yeah <laughs> as they like you know the camera angles you know they cut to another camera angle and the five o'clock shadow comes back <laughs> Yeah, things change. But we're kind of back to it now because Euphoria, at least they look like teenagers and they don't look like John Travolta in Greece. <laughs> this is true. Right. This is true. But yeah, I, I just think, you know, and to be clear, Ben, just so you know, we're not doing the, we're, this. We're not a show that sits down and goes, ah, people today, it's it, the cancel culture or anything like that. I just mean rather how we balance and the conversation we're constantly having with film about our responsibility to depict or not depict things, you know, which I think is something that, especially when it deals with young people fluctuates, I mean, you know, and not just about how clear we are on the morals in terms of like, if you look at juvenile delinquent films from around this time, uh, especially like, you know, rebel without a cost to some degree, but like a blackboard jungle or whatever, the angle is always like, well, what these kids are doing is wrong, and how do we reach them, and how do we fix them? And then you go all the way to, like, movies that we watched in the 90s. Like, think about teen films in the 90s, that especially kids as an example, but that is just, I mean, outright nihilistic. There's no positive in that movie, you know? And there's no attempt to, to kind of go, how do we, you know, how do these kids get right? And now I think we're kind of moving a little back in a direction of 
not a haze cut or anything like that, but just kind of an understanding of like, let's make sure that these young folks know, like, we get what you're going through, but also please don't do every drug possible. You know, I feel like that's the shift. And maybe I'm wrong, but that feels like the shift. It's hard to say. I mean, it, I, I hear you. And the, well, well, what I'll share is I watched this again recently and it to- I had such a different experience as an adult. Mm hmm than when I watched as a teenager. And I, I definitely remember as a teenager being wildly unimpressed. Okay. Because I didn't, I think, really just appreciate the influence of this. Mm-hmm. But I think it was just also, I was like, he's not even that bad. <laughs> like, what did he even do? I mean, he does you have know? a knife fight. Well, listen, who amongst us hasn't? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> also uh, just like it's not I even get... a knife fight they're just poking at each other okay first of all <laughs> all right yeah. like okay. so there's rules okay this uh-huh. isn't just like a like you know no holds bar knife fight no yeah this there's there's a sense of decorum to this whole thing <laughs> yeah which yeah, uh exactly. yeah basically is exactly how they filmed it with real knives and they wore chain mail under their shirts so when they got poked they didn't actually get stabbed but also i mean obviously accidents were gonna happen not <laughs> just real knives stabbed in the ear let's please acknowledge because switchblades were illegal in california the only way they could get them was the lapd gave them actual switchblades that had been confiscated from actual street gangs <laughs> all right i have a question guys yeah. have you ever had a knife confiscated yes absolutely no okay, cool i okay were, were you a knife kid ben well, I wasn't really a knife kid. I would say I more, though, had an opportunity to buy a switchblade. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, what kid can't not? Yeah, right. And I think I, I think I got caught with it probably less than 24 hours later <laughs> and like had lost it already. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we had a, we had a guy in our, in our high school. And this was like knives were his obsession, and he was like buying a ton of them online, and then he would just sell them to other people. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he had like a whole. I I assembled like a small collection back in high school of like pocket knives, and yes, one of them was a a switchblade because it's illegal in New York, but it was the uh, it was the early like George W. Bush era of the internet when it was just lawless, nice. and like you remember how like seemingly. Every state had their own laws, but not a single one of them thought like, oh, on the internet, you can order stuff by mail. And so shit would just get shipped, you know, back. So yes, so I did did have that. I don't have it anymore. In that case, the switchblade was never confiscated. The switchblade was one where the, I think the spring just eventually stopped working in it, and it just hung limply. So not terribly impressive. Not as effective, yeah. No. You don't want a limp switchblade. That's <laughs> just not intimidating. <laughs> I mean, well, that is a bit of why uh, James Dean is not very thrilled with his father because uh, his switchblade has gone limp in that marriage, <laughs> bringing it back to the movie there. And speaking of limp switchblades, thanks to our sponsor, Blue Chew. Blue Chew, you, no, we don't, they don't, they don't sponsor us. I just thought that was a fun tie-in. Uh, but yes, you're right, Tom, about uh, Jim's dad. Well, I guess I can't call him Jim's dad because now we all think of uh, right, American yeah. Pie. But um but, oh, that would have know. been something if, if if James Dean was just sadly screwing an apple pie. Oh, I thought you were going to can't s- feel anything. I thought you were going to say if Eugene Levy played the dad, which pretty close because the dad is played by Thurston Howell the Third from Gilligan's Island. So you know, listen, Netflix reboot, <laughs> Rebel Without a Cause. Eugene Levy plays Jim's dad. Jim is played by uh, the son. What I already I forgot Dan his Levy? name. Dan Levy, yeah, yeah, obviously. And uh, yeah, just a shit, Shit's Creek reunion. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, so we were... Oh, I was saying that, like... Um, oh, he, you were saying you watched when you were a teenager, you felt he wasn't that bad. Yeah, that he wasn't yeah. that bad. Yeah, yeah, you know, but re-watching it now, it, what hit for me was... I mean, and we're saying it already, that this is like sort of a type of film that is like the, the, like the teens are going crazy. Like, it's very much kind of done from the parents perspective a little bit more than i think i picked up on the first time around i watched Mm -hmm. it like these teens are out of control 
like it feeling almost like it, it really read a lot more this time around too as like a little after school especially mm-hmm. but um what dean is bringing to the performance is just so much of the character's interiority and it's it's an incredible performance i mean obviously it's of its time but i at the same time i think that there's something that i i i find myself missing about that performance in today's films in terms of like you know tom tom knows that i i often lament about a movie you know when i complain about movies that are that are uh tough guy movies you know where it's just like i i find like ryan gosling does the you know it, like the ryan gosling um drive only god forgives kind of thing of just like I'm a tough guy, so I don't feel nothing. I don't feel any emotions at all at any point. And when I look at Dean, who was such an icon for, you know, uh, tough guys back in the day, and he's so vulnerable in this. And he's, and I think that that's not just true. That's true in in so many of Nicholas Ray's movies. Uh, Ben, have you ever seen um, uh, In a Lonely Place? I have not. Uh, It's a, I, I think, I fair to say, Tom, that's your favorite Nick Ray movie, right? In a lonely place. Uh, yes, sir. That it's, is indeed correct. It, I, I, Ben, if you get a chance to check it out, I highly recommend it. It is uh, basically, I think the only way to synopsize it is it's a film noir about uh, Humphrey Bogart playing a man who has a lot of emotions and most of them are anger. And it's so interesting to see that because there is just like a, there was in the fifties and sixties kind of a real vulnerability to our on-screen depictions of 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 tougher guys and like a guy could have very clear anger issues and also cry and i think that that's a lot closer to what a lot of you know the moments where jim is vulnerable in this i think speak to the moments where a lot of us feel vulnerable i don't think you know it's not him crying uh just over nothing there's that moment where he's talking to the cop and says like if i could just have one day one day where I didn't feel so so confused and and felt like I belonged somewhere like that feels like such a universal feeling, you know. And it and it's it's a universal feeling and it's so of that age in mm-hmm. your life. Yeah. And like on rewatching it now, like it has it. I just like I was like, oh my god, like just really remembering and feeling that time in your life when you're a senior junior in high school and just like the pressure you feel about your future and the pressure you feel of, of just fitting in with your peers, having romantic interest and in how to pursue those people. It's really a, such a hard time. And I, I think we've said it, said it enough, but this is like one of the, I think a film that's like really, one of the early ones that's kind of showing that. Yeah. I mean, there's a, there's a line I think of a lot. It's from a very different uh, thing, but uh, there's a line in the musical, a chorus line talking about teenage years. And the description they use is um, too young to take over too old to ignore. And I think that that kind of sums up the, the idea of being a teenager, which is like you, you suddenly have control. You suddenly have a degree of power and a degree of self-awareness that you didn't have as a child, but the world is not ready for you to actually do anything yet. And the world is not built to accept you yet. So as a result, you're in this position where you have the power to exercise control over things. You have the power to do things, but but uh, nothing to do. Um, you know, when, when Jim is talking about, like, you know, just wanting to feel like he belonged somewhere... I think about like, I mean, look, when we were teenagers, right? I, I think we all at some point uh, uh, broke shit, blew shit up, uh, you know, got into, all, you know, it caused a lot of destruction. And I think part of what motivated us to cause that destruction is just you, you felt like you were actually doing something by destroying something. You know what I mean? If you if you threw a rock through a window, you actually got to feel like you you had some control over a world that you you otherwise didn't am i am i you know what i'm saying i know what you're saying i also think it's just you're 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 maybe angry yeah um you're also just acting out because i mean i don't i didn't i've i have i am in therapy 
So I'm currently working on all of this. Why I'm like asking this question of myself, like, why did I have a slingshot? <laughs> you know, and yeah. I don't think I can answer that question necessarily, uh, other than to say to break stuff with it. So, yeah. I mean, I think, yeah, if I had to read into it, though, I was a, an angry kid um, who, yeah, was just like looking to put that energy and point it towards something. Yeah, I, and I think that that's kind of what motivates everyone in this film. I mean, you know, one thing I think is so compelling, and, and you talked, uh, Ben, about like watching this as a young person and then watching it as an adult. I think the thing that really changed for me from when I watched this young to now, and I watched this movie a ton uh, when I was young because I had the James Dean box set. I was so fascinated by this. Um, but the thing I thought was interesting is when I was a kid, I really got what was going on. I mean, you know, I felt like, oh, yeah, you know, the film is very direct about what's going on in Jim's household, right? Because you have those monologues that Jim delivers about his dad and, and, and his, you know, his emasculated father and you're tearing me apart. And Plato is very direct about what's going on in his home. But I think as a young person, I didn't get what was going on with Natalie Wood other than like, oh, her parents just don't understand her. And this viewing is when I really clued into the sexuality aspect of it, you know, and the fact yep. that that the father is, you know, essentially like that Natalie Wood's main problem is because and I think it's in part because especially it's the 50s. We're not talking about sex. We're not talking about any yeah. of this to our young people. No, we are not. So Natalie Wood doesn't understand why her father used to be affectionate to her and physical with her and now he he you know if she tries to kiss him he he slaps her which is in, it's wild it, it uh, is so so crazy uh you know this the movie starts out they're uh you know after the, the opening credits it's like right into jail to yep. the juvenile detention center or whatever um and that's when we uh we meet her character and well no I guess it's then later with the second kind of interview more with Plato, but a psychotherapy yeah. yeah counseling comes up in some way. And I just like I wanna mention that too because I think that also is weirdly kind of becoming more and more of a relatively mainstream thing oh yeah this time yeah and so the psychology of her father slapping her because she kissed him i mean like it, it's that i mean that's wild stuff but yeah well it, and it's it, yeah. It, it, no no i mean i think the one thing to remember about this time too is while there's still hostility to the idea of going to therapy right and 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 that you don't go to a quote unquote head shrinker or Sal Minio from the Bronx head shrinker, which I love so dearly, uh, his pronunciation <laughs> of that. Um, yeah. But uh, little Ralph Macchio. Yeah, we love it. Um, but so uh, Sal Minio, and you know, the, the idea of a regular person, quote unquote, going to that is still uh, taboo, you know, and, and would be yeah. for decades. But this is the introduction in the 50s of the idea of psychology coming into play. I mean, even the book that this is based on is a nonfiction book that's kind of getting into the psychology, and, and suddenly your average American is becoming vaguely familiar with ideas like an Oedipal complex and things like that, and starting to get into, you know, the, uh, you know, understanding mental health, but in a way that we kind of cyclically do in this country where we uh, get introduced to mental health concepts, we start to understand them, and then we over-understand them to the point where we're just throwing out terms left, right, and center, and it, you know? That's kind of like in that 50s era where people are kind of dying. I mean, that's, you know, six years later with the movie, but West Side Story, uh, you know, that whole bit in, you know, G. Officer Krupke, where they're doing the song, right? Yeah. And it's that entire thing is just about people, at, you know, overanalyzing and ascribing different causes to this. You know, of it's the of, bureaucracy, but it's just this endless cycle. 
Yeah, and we're seeing it it's like- It's a snake eating its own tail, the system. We're seeing it now. It. Yeah, and we're seeing it now with like, you know, obviously there are people- uh, on online, uh, making jokes about how every single uh, film or TV show that comes out now, somebody goes, it's about trauma, right? And it's about this, and just kind of, they've reduced things to kind of buzzwords in a way. Mm. Um, and I feel like that's one of the other things you're dealing with, I think, with this film, is that the approach to psychology in the 50s, especially when it comes to these young people, is not, let's help you but just kind of the stance of, all right, let's figure out what's wrong with you. Let's figure mm-hmm. out what's wrong. And then once we've identified what's wrong, we will send you to prison or to a facility where you don't leave. And then... Where they will electrocute you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like you you guys recently, I mean, I guess not not recently. And when this episode comes out, it won't be recent because you right. guys will be on to your next miniseries and what have you. But... Uh, when we're recording this, you recently talked about an angel at my table, right? And the, mm-hmm. the you know, the uh, electroshock about therapy. Author, um, uh, what is uh, her? Uh, Janet Frame. Thank you. I almost said Jane Curtin, which is a very different person. Uh, but Janet <laughs> Frame. And, and the fact that it was kind of like this feeling. I mean, obviously, she did have mental health issues. But there, this idea of kind of just going, all right, we figured out what's wrong with you. Now go away until it's fixed. And yeah. that's. That's kind of what we're dealing with now. And, you know, you see it again in the 70s. And, and, and again, we're seeing it in a different direction now, which is like at a certain, you know, the, the people they have, the society has the language to identify certain things, but they don't have the tools to actually properly address it. Well, I mean, I'm a Prider side guy. I just want to say, like, I totally hear you. But I also think talking about the 50s, right? It, like not that long ago, they would treat like mental health with leeches or some shit. You know what I mean? No, like, for we've sure. come yeah. a long way, but then it's like we've got a lot to go. Oh, well, I mean, because sure, yeah. also think about this aspect of it: why Plato wouldn't want a head shrinker, as he says, is in 1955, a head shrinker might very quickly and unclearly understand that Plato is gay. Yeah, and that is not something you want to be found out as in 1955 yeah. suburban California, which is yeah they will throw you away and electrocute your brain, hopefully to quote unquote you know get the gay out of them. Yeah, you know, it, like like Ben said, yeah they came a long way from the 50s from you know leeching the problems away, but also. Plato wasn't going to have the best ending no matter if he got shot or not at the end, you know? Yeah. I mean, this is, yeah. And you also have to remember, like, we're, as a country, uh, you know, we're, we're at that point, 1955, we are only a few decades uh, away, you know, uh, beyond when our country was, like, heavily advocating for eugenics and shit. <laughs> so, you know, there's still that well, attitude in our older generations in the 50s that are, like, Decades. Let's get the problem people out of society. I mean, shit, 15 years ago, and in, in the time of this movie was World War II, but also 15 years ago, like 1940s, like actually 1940 Madison Square Garden, yeah. there was a Nazi rally. <laughs> like yeah. that, that kind of shit wasn't that long ago from when this movie came out where, yeah, a lot of people were just open with, yeah, this needs to be a much whiter nation. Yeah, so there's, there's a lot of, you know, there's a... The, I, I don't want to just say the distrust of authority is is justified or anything like that, but I do think it's a situation where, and and Tom, you talked about the you know the 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 homosexuality aspect of it. Now, interestingly enough, the commentary I was listening to on the on the Blu-ray for this film, the guy doing the commentary says, well, you know, some people read homosexuality into this film, and obviously the Motion Picture Code would not permit any mention of of homosexuality. Uh, he goes, it's up to interpretation. I don't read the relationship between uh, Plato and Jim as as a homosexual attraction from Plato. And while typically when we deal with films that have ambiguous sexual readings, I tend to say, hey, it can go either way. I got to say, this is one of those movies where, especially with Nicholas Ray behind the camera, I'm like, there's no way you can well, read this any other way to me. I mean, than... just the way he looks at jim yeah. but also like he opens his locker and he's got who, oh god i can't remember who's the picture he's got a picture of alan ladd yes and at like a movie star photo of alan ladd in his locker i mean 
and yeah, like what you said with Nicholas Ray behind the camera and also what Nicholas Ray did to Salminio off camera is kind of, yeah, they're leaning into something yeah. here. And obviously Sal Mineo himself was, was a, a, a bisexual, you know, uh, was, was bisexual in his, in his day. And, and I, I believe toward the end of his life, more open about that. Crazy behind the scenes stuff from this movie. <laughs> oh yeah. Nicholas Ray went between uh, Sal, Sal Mineo and Natalie, and Natalie Wood. Wood. And allegedly James Dean had affairs with Natalie Wood and Sal Mineo. And there's well, a lot going uh, on in Natal- this movie. Yeah. Natalie Wood was also having an affair with Dennis Hopper. And that's why all of his scenes and dialogue was pretty much cut out of the movie. Apparently Nicholas Ray was feeling vindictive and, uh, surprisingly though, you wouldn't see, uh, I don't think you see like a crazy production while watching the movie. It feels pretty, pretty, yeah. Like straight, concise to the point, you know, it doesn't feel like there's deleted scenes or anything that you're missing from the movie at least in my view this was the first time i've seen it and i still um, have a pretty clear no. sense of the movie oh i think i think there what i was what i was like wondering if it got cut out was there was no huffing and i just feel like that's a big <laughs> teen thing in general like kind of universal again you know like teens still grabbing a rag <laughs> Well, I, none of that. I so mean, I agree. I think inaccurate. I, there Listen, is, it, I agree. I think there, ne- there needed to be in the scene where Buzz was was huffing before getting into the car, because really, only someone that's high out of their mind could not get a coat off of a door handle. And I mean, then die. There is implication at one point because the head of the when they go to the observatory, right? When they're at the yeah. the Griffith Observatory. Uh, afterward, they're having the you know the knife fight, and the cop and the guy from the observatory see the kids. One of them describes the kids as, I believe, hoop heads, which is I, I, I similar to like hop heads. Right. I believe the implication there is like those kids are on dope, you know, which they're obviously not going to show in the film. Jim is 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 drinking a lot. Yeah. That's blunt from the beginning. Yes, the description of them as hoop heads. Uh, I believe is meant to imply like these kids today high on their reefer and opium or whatever we had then because uppers and downers were just things that we prescribed to housewives at that point. So, but the military is, I think, at this point, starting to uh, experiment um, on soldiers with LSD and stuff. Yeah, they haven't moved into. I I don't know. I mean, we we don't have the records, but they. I don't think they've started playing around the suburbs yet. But yeah, LSD has not become. I don't think the psychedelics have really caught on outside of like the beatnik community. Absolutely. I, yeah. I would imagine at this point in the suburbs you've got marijuana and then you've got whatever amphetamines or whatever that you steal out of your parents' medicine cabinets because well it's the 50s. All the adults are hopped up on amphetamines. Yeah, you could get amphetamines basically like you know, it would be sold to you as like toothache medicine. Yeah. <laughs> Uncle Jim's toothache medicine. <laughs> Here, drink this bottle of cocaine. <laughs> What's that, Jim? Your wife needs to lose weight. Give her these pills. Like, that's that truly happened back then. Yeah, um, it really did. Well, that's the weird thing is, like, during, like, the 80s, when the 50s nostalgia springs up, like, this movie gets kind of reclaimed, even though this movie is very much about, hey, life is hell right now. <laughs> yeah, and yet like- it's reclaimed as, like, hey, remember the, the swinging 50s? Remember going the to sock hops and it's like no people the died for nothing. Fifties. Well, they what did they call the fifties? Like there wasn't really the fifties. I know, but I'm saying uh, like there wasn't a you know. Yeah, I don't think I don't know. <laughs> I think it was just the fifties. I like, know, but I was I trying know. to come up with a description. But yes, so I, I'm just trying to imagine like watching American graffiti and being like, oh, yeah, that's swinging time. <laughs> Everybody's just 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 running away from Harrison Ford and his hot rod. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I mean, listen, uh, one of the things I felt watching this movie was a similar sensation I got watching the original West Side Story, which is, this is very good, but also, like, I kind of wish somebody could, like, like, I wish Spielberg and Tony Kushner could, like, take this and modernize it to kind of have a little bit more of that stuff that we're talking about kind of there, the way, like, I don't know. They, they heighten the racial elements and the class elements, but also, like, the knife fights in West Side Story. It's like, oh, no, somebody's, like, might actually die doing this. There's danger here where 
I do kind of get like, oh, I wish this was like 10 years later, maybe. Totally. Boring. I don't know. Here's my pitch, though. Here's my pitch, okay? Like, okay. Let's see. Updated version, right? Remake. Yes. Okay. Make them old. Because here's the thing. I'm an aging, like, guy. You know, I'm trying to figure out how to, like, stay true to, like, that punk kid. But then also not, like, you know, you have to, you got to evolve, you know? So I'd love to see a Rebel Without a Cause with a character, Jim, old, okay, going to a retirement home, new guy in the retirement home. <laughs> and ben? then you could get, you know, you could get like into a, maybe not a knife fight, maybe a cane fight. They get a, they get a roaring game of a, of a, of a shuffleboard. So, right. so to be clear, Ben, your pitch for a modernized Rebel Without a Cause is the 2013 film Jackass Presents Bad Grandpa. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Let me, let me give the full title. Academy Award nominee Jackass Presents Bad Grandpa. I'm sorry. I did well, one this also, right. yes. <laughs> this also <laughs> sounds like this this sounds like the Twilight Zone short Spielberg actually directed in the Twilight Zone movie. That is true. Just Scatman Corella's rolling in and being like, Hey gang, <laughs> you wanna be young again? When we were young and crazy kids back in the swing in fifties. <laughs> The swing in fifties. You're, we're gonna make that a thing by the end of this episode, <laughs> Ben. All yes, I all I ask, and 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 you can absolutely forget this in five minutes. All I ask is just once, on blank check, if the fifties comes up, just casually say swing in fifties. Just put it out into the universe. I'm sure everybody will just pass it by in the moment, but just put it out there like it's a regular thing. You guys got a big listenership, and people will listen to you and trust you, and be like, "I guess that was what they called the fifties." Okay, you know, you've got I'll that. I'll do influence. it on blank check, and I will do it in just casual conversation as just, well. Too. No one will. No, <laughs> that's just in your day to day. Just like, oh, you didn't know? Yeah, yeah that's what they called it back then. Yeah, yep, back in absolutely. the you know, it all started here. <laughs> <laughs> let me let me say that, Tom, to your point about like modernizing or anything like that. The difference is like. And for me, like, I feel that more with the 61 West Side Story than I do with this, and that's solely because, and I, I mean, no disrespect to, to Robert Wise, you know, I'm not going to be like, Robert Wise was a terrible director. I mean, obviously, I like, uh, I want to live. I love the day the earth stood still. Uh, I kind of like Star Trek, the motion picture, because I'm that kind of guy. But I think that Robert Wise did not necessarily have the visual language as a filmmaker to convey the subtext in a way that i think nicholas ray the, the i mean this movie is is visually uh remarkable to watch i mean not just because it's in cinemascope or anything like that but just some of the shot choices i think really speak to what's going on in these scenes in a way that they yes they had to deal with the code and i think that, that maybe inspires them to come up with some fun visual things i mean obviously the the tilted angle when Jim is fighting with his parents on the stairs. There's a beautiful overhead shot when they're going into the empty pool. There's a lot that kind of, that Nicholas Ray is saying things with the images that I think sometimes speak to the emotion of these characters and the emotion of these moments more than having a line of dialogue uh, necessarily could, you know? And I th I, listen, I think this is a, better and more complete and fitting i guess a uh, movie than west side story what i'm i just think there's like it just has that you you just want it to be just slightly more modern and be able to slightly get a little maybe it also have a little more clear-eyed sense of the time because this like this is good at sensing the time and like the problems of the time but you also kind of want to have some changes where it's like okay there may be a little too okay with the cops in this movie instead of like layering in that the cops might actually be a big part of the problem too or some stuff like that i don't know i'm just it's, saying it's weird i don't I mean, tony I, Kushner, give me a call i would say it's the opposite i would say that that i think this film is 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 fairly clear in its stance on on the the failings of the police system because you have you introduce us at the beginning uh, oh my God! I'm forgetting the actor's name. The chief from Get Smart. Uh, you know the 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 cop who befriends Jim at the start, right? Yeah. When because all three of them are in in jail at the beginning, and he speaks to them all, right? And he speaks to all of them, and you get the feeling that like, oh, this if you were watching this for the first time, you would think, oh, this is kind of you know this is gonna be like a blackboard jungle. This is gonna be a movie about. 
this one cop and how he helps these three kids. And he like, oh, Jim, call me anytime. And Plato, let's try and help you out and all that, right? And <laughs> then killed five dogs? That's okay. <laughs> no judgment. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe uh, talk to somebody about that, my man. Uh, anyway, have a good one. Okay, yeah. Tom. Tom, I'm now all for your remake, but Ben has to play the the cop in exactly that delivery. That has to be yeah. his character. But but what I'm saying is, oh, you, the... you killed five dogs. Oh yeah, absolutely no, nothing, not a problem. Also, hey, here's an uh, an application to be a cop. <laughs> but <I'm... laughs> wait, actually, you're hired. <laughs> um, you're now the chief of police. But I yeah. <laughs> but I do think that when you think about it, like. The only good law enforcement character is, you know, is him, is the one guy who befriends all three. And then he doesn't actually do anything. The moment Jim needs him, he is pointedly not there. And then Jim is trying to talk to the other cops who just brush him off and want nothing to do with him. And then the only actual thing that any cop does in this movie is shoot Plato. Like this movie is is very much like it starts out, tri- I think tricking its audience into thinking, well, this guy seems upstanding. He's gonna help these kids out, and then his one moment he could have, he's not there. They don't actually fix well, anything. I think that's more of a thing about the, them being adults instead of being cops, because they do at least paint him as wanting to help him. Jim. Yes, and but wa- he is. But- a- but One then they also give the cop- system. All right, but then they also give the cops kind of that typical for the time out of oh well, Plato had a gun; they had to shoot him instead of just being like, well, no, they they would they would have just shot him because that's kind of just what they would have done instead of that's a that's kind of a nineteen fifty five out that that they were doing shit like that in the eighties too. Like oh well, he had a gun; he had to do it. I mean, it's literally the fucking plot point for Al Powell and Die Hard. Well, the kid had a gun; I did, I had nothing else to do. Do you think they call negotiators in all the time, though? <laughs> no, I, I'm, I just it just because like I know that wasn't the original way Plato was going to die. That's just kind of how they got to it. And interesting. I, yeah, do you I don't know. Speak maybe to the original Plato death, Tom, while we're here. I got to find it in my notes. I mean, if you know it off the top of your head, I just um, I just remember that it wasn't this ending i have it somewhere in my notes but i was hoping you had it sooner so i wouldn't have no i i don't because i'm a i'm a sloppy boy uh i don't know we'll get back to it but yeah yeah, that wasn't the end it's just kind of one of those things of like i know what it's going for but also it's 1955 they maybe don't know how much the police and them being I don't know, incompetent or just not even caring or whatever. And then just like, you know, shooting a 15 year old kid who didn't have bullets in his gun and everything because they were freaking him out. Like I, I, I it's uh, ultimately, I don't think this movie needs to get remade the way West side story does. I just had that same feeling of, Ooh, like maybe five, 10 years later when Hollywood can get you a little more honest about things and not have to be so subtextual maybe there's something here i don't know that was just something i felt watching this movie okay so now i gotta say as far as like going through the plot i don't think that the the sense i had is you guys didn't want to necessarily do that but what i mean we're here for whatever oh wait let me make one note by the way tom sorry give me one sec because i I knew i had this offhand in terms of uh nicholas ray and his attitude toward law enforcement it's just uh Worth noting that he was uh, actively involved with filming uh, the Black Panther Party and the Chicago 7 and the uh, War in Vietnam. And uh, Nicholas Ray and his crew arrived at the scene of Fred Hampton's assassination to film it the next day. So whether or not this film, where this film stands on on the effect of his law enforcement, uh, Nicholas Ray definitely is of the reading that the police uh, absolutely failed these young people. Uh, so just wanted to put that out there in terms of Nicholas Ray and his particular stance. Sorry, Ben, continue. Cool. No worries. So something we hear, I think basically between Jim and his dad really early on that I think is such an important line. And it's like called back at least once, if not twice as the 10 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the other part of that is uh, you'll look, you'll look back and laugh. Yeah, which um, is a minor threat song that I love. Too. <laughs> uh, 
Um, but yeah, that, that, which again, minor threats, a perfect example of like, you're angry, you're in your late teens, early twenties and everyone's telling you like now doesn't matter. Yeah. And you're like, well, I feel now right now. And I feel bad and horny and confused. And you, everyone around me is telling me that like, these are the best years of your life and they don't feel like the best years of my life whatsoever. Even just the whole like idea of appreciate this time. Like adults are always saying that to you, appreciate this time. And of course I understand now I'm in my mid thirties, like what they're getting at. But when you're at that age, the energy of your life is very different. And it's, it's interesting. You said, you know, you point to that because I think part of it too is, is, I mean, you know, you have Jim's father telling him, like, you know, uh, well, you know, you're uh, this won't matter in 10 years. You won't remember this, you know. And what is Jim harping on is the idea of, like, honor and self-respect and all of that. And I think that, you know, Jim's relationship to his father is he sees his father as is emasculated as spineless you know he's his father's wearing an apron his father is is non-confrontational and i think that where jim's anger comes from is is kind of a reaction to that he looks at that i mean look a lot of us have that you know i think most people you know just psychologically like have things when they look to their parents and they hit their teenage years where they go i don't want to be that and i think that you know especially in this case that's the way he looks at his his father and it's not just about, oh, in 10 years, it's the idea of like, you know, that in 10 years, I'll wind up like you. And and I, I think that if he wants, he wants to be something different. I mean, the very first time we see Jim over the credits is him, he come, he's drunk, he comes across this mechanical monkey toy on the ground. And what does he do? He tucks it into bed. He's paternal to the toy, right? And I think that, you know what you're saying, Ben, about you know that the ten years who you'll be in ten years. Like, there's also an element of, uh, you know, when they say enjoy it, these best years left. This is the time where you're figuring out who you're gonna be, right? Your teenage years are when you are figuring out what kind of person you are going to be. So when you're looking back, knowing where you wound up, it feels silly. Or well, everything you got mad about felt silly, but in those moments, it's it's defining the person you would become right absolutely and it's like now it's like or even it just making me like some like little jerk off on twitter just drop like you're gonna look back and laugh you know just yeah. that little young troll but yeah, unfortunately, they can actually look back and see all the horrible shit that they <laughs> wrote on the internet. And yeah, thankfully, yeah. we don't have to do that. Well, I mean, listen, we were the Tom and I were of the MySpace generation, so there's some digital records oh. somewhere, you know. But there okay. sadly is. I also kind of felt maybe a little bit of with the at the end when Jim's dad is like, "Listen, I'm gonna be the man you are. You need me to be now, and all that stuff." And even with all the ten year later, nothing's gonna. All this is gonna be a joke. I don't, it it just always felt like it felt to me like there's something in there of him trying to be like, "I've been where you are right now," mm-hmm. you know, like because you get the sense that he his his father is also a kid of money with the way the the grandmother is in yeah. the police station at the beginning she's got that old money i could do yeah. whatever i want and sort she's of she's wearing feel. a fur she's got a shiny yeah. brooch she's got money she's got yeah. that like ooh like lady you know like this yeah. the lady from the yeah. simpsons voice <laughs> well she's she she feels like she probably took the maiden voyage of the fucking titanic or something like she was a she's a woman of, so oh, I, it yeah. feels like there's this honest sort of like yeah maybe like 30 40 years later i kind of became this guy who's you know kind of henpecked by his wife and everything and all that you may think what i Which am all, is bad but yeah, like i know what is, you are all of that is a little weird 
it is weird now that is one it's, of those things yeah, where yeah that is one of those of the moment yeah that's again that's one of those things where it feels like in a remake they could maybe find <sighs> different angles to show why jim is so annoyed with his parents but again it's 1955 it's you know i get it the masculinity at types and ideals at the time were yeah, the, of such the where mom... he could say why don't you hit mom <laughs> like, i know yeah the mom is essentially she her character she's just like a walking frying pan that's just like hitting the dad <laughs> yeah I mean, such a bummer <laughs> he's I, just I, like just hit mom just hit mom and i'll respect you i'm like well that's shit that's the thing i think that uh, when i you know for me part of that with this film is that what it is getting at in a way is that you know jim does not actually have anyone he can look to and and it's not even necessarily in a like every house needs a man but rather that you know jim is so obsessed with honor right i mean he's willing to he i mean the moment that i think makes it all come clear and the moment i think that makes it clear of his relationship to his dad is that his father it's not that his father is you know just not masculine or anything. It's that his father is afraid. It's that, yeah. you know, it's that his father drops the tray of stuff and, and Jim's going, Dad, leave it. And his dad's going, No, I'll clean it up before your mother wakes up. I'll clean. And so ultimately, that boils down to when Jim is saying, I'm going to go to the cops and turn myself in because someone died. And his dad is going, like, Well, don't get ahead of yourself, son. Don't get it. You know, don't do this. Don't. And he's, his father is so afraid. And I think that the, yeah, I mean, obviously, yes, there is that line early on that I think is is uh, shocking, uh, you know, now. And I think it was even kind of, you know, obviously in a different time, but still a little shocking. Where he's like, if he just hit her once. But you do get the idea of like what Jim's really trying to communicate in his own language is the idea of I just want to see my father have an identity, like have a sense of self. And constantly Jim goes to his dad for advice and his dad gives him nothing. He goes to his dad for advice, and it's essentially like the the um, the Polonius speech in Hamlet, where he's you know where he's telling his son like, "Well, be strong, but also weak. Be quiet, but also let like it doesn't mean anything." And I think that you know when you look at this, what see Tom, I I I totally see your read on Jim's dad saying like, "I used to be this way." Whereas to me, I think that when I look at Jim's dad, my read has always been that Jim's father was the opposite that Jim's father was one of these guys who did exactly what he was told and did, you know, went where his mother told him to go and married the girl his mother told him was good for him to marry and was just like, and just listened to what people told him his whole life and is trying to give his son advice of, well, son, uh, do what I do and you'll turn out like me, happy. And Jim is looking at him essentially saying, but you're not happy. Like your well, life sucks. Well, it's. I think it really kind of all comes down to that look that Jim's mom and dad give each other at the end. Yeah. Like, there's this, like, the one moment of, like, connection where you kind of see why these two married each other. And it just has this history to it. Like, there's something there. And it's, and it's, and it's, again, it's like, he's an older guy. So Jim's 15. This guy must have had Jim when he was, like... Honestly, I'm going to say 40, like maybe 35. So this seems like a guy who maybe got started in his life later than we think. Yeah. Because maybe, you know, I maybe not necessarily Jim to a T, but also after watching basically his adopted son get shot by the police at the end, Jim might change after this. Oh yeah. There might be there might be a sense of fear that runs through him because of all of this that maybe leads him to either Natalie Wood or someone else he marries and he becomes the henpecked father who knows what it's like to be a crazy teen who sees people run off cliffs in their car and then get shot by the cops because everyone's just so fucking, like Ben said, horny and angry and sad that they just can't get out of their own ways. But part of it too is the, the I mean, they, Jim and Judy and John, uh, you know, the three core characters we have form this sort of surrogate family because ultimately I think there's also an element of, you know, this is the fifties. This is kind of the first generation that isn't encouraged to 
uh, get married and and raise babies right out of high school, if not sooner, right? And yet they're all feeling this, you know, Jim and, and Judy especially are feeling this maternal and paternal instinct, which they obviously uh, express toward John or, or Plato. Uh, but one thing I think is interesting is, is the difference you see is Jim is, from the beginning, trying to be understanding. And at the end, when we get to the observatory and Plato is hiding with the gun, Jim is talking to Plato in a way that I think he wishes his father had talked to him. Because when he oh, yeah. tells his father, oh, I'm going to go and do this. Ra- uh, Dad, what if you feel you got to do something? And his father is just like, think of your future. Think of this. Ah, and he's so confrontational. And Jim, when he approaches Plato, he's very calm and just, hey, buddy, you know, you want to come out? And like, he's, I, I think that that's the key thing here um, with this movie and particularly with these characters is that Jim's dad believes that he is a good father because he is financially providing for his family and because he is uh, he is telling his son the right thing to do. But he's not nurturing him, and he's not reaching him. No one, neither his mother nor his father, is actually trying to nurture Jim in any way. And I think that, you know, something, Ben, you talked about with, with just feeling angry all the time and all that is, I, you know, I, I think that when you're that age, you you mentioned all the people telling you, oh, these are the best years of your life anybody who's telling you that isn't actually trying to reach you or empathize with you. They're just trying to push you one way or the other, you know? Yeah. Empathy is the big word there. They're as friends, this like family that's forming there. There's empathy, great empathy for each other. And that's huge. I, I think that that's, that's the big thing too, with the, I mean, we talked about the cop character. Like, he tries to be their friend, but at the same time, he's the one who's like, hey, Jim, call me any day or night. I'm there for you. And then the one time Jim goes to him, he's not there. And in this case, you know, that feeling of abandonment, you know, Jim feels that with um, with the with the officer. And then Plato obviously feels that when, when he is lying outside and Jim and Judy uh, leave Plato alone to go whatever uh you know i think we know the implication there but of where of where jim and judy go and what they go to do but nevertheless uh you know it's it's that plato freaks the fuck out and shoots a gang member in part because he feels abandoned that sense of abandonment every one of them feels it in some way i mean in in jim's case it's the fact that his parents are, by all accounts, you know, picking up and picking him up and moving him every time he gets in trouble because they don't want to confront it. Uh, they don't want there to be consequences for his actions. Judy feels rejected by her father, obviously, because of her their sexual awakening, and uh, Plato feels rejected by his family because they just straight up keep abandoning him. So they think, literally rejected him. <laughs> yes, they did, absolutely. You know, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm laughing. No, it's it's not funny. And I think I just think that it's interesting that you know, and especially with Jim, like that his conflict is partly like that his family keeps protecting him. You know, it seems like there's a part of him that want. He says, "You can't keep moving me around. You can't keep doing this." Like he's he wants there to be some kind of structure he wants there to there's be- almost that he's almost asking for consequences i mean yes. they're enabling him clearly yeah and he wants because he wants i think what jim wants and he expresses it when he talks oh, like there's that moment where he's begging his father just to to stand up for him against his mother right where he's begging his father like dad just just tell her no right and then when his father is too weak to do that he starts choking him yeah. Which, by the way, apparently that whole scene was supposed to take place in uh, the parents' bedroom, and James Dean wasn't sure about it. Went to, uh, went to, I believe, the uh, hotel room or wherever Nicholas Ray was living at the time to rehearse the scene, and said, "No, this room's great," and made Nicholas Ray recreate his living room as the set because that's where James felt most comfortable doing the the confrontation. So that's wild, but. He's choking his father because I think James, you know, Jim's character is just looking for, I don't want to say just discipline, but he's looking for structure. He's looking for some kind of, you know, some kind of structure and some kind of support, which he just doesn't get. He also has idealism, which yeah. is a, you know, a young person's game. 
and then you know eventually you get jaded because the world beats you down completely and um you just keep going and he's anyway continue no but and and you see that he's you know for as much as this is rebel without a cause you see that he is not always angry because there's a great moment in the movie it's a very minor thing but i love it so much because if you didn't have this scene you might mistake jim as somebody that's just you know uh he's just always looking for a fight but when he's going to the school it's his first day he steps on the school insignia on the ground yeah and some other student runs up and goes hey hey what are you doing we don't step on that and jim just goes um i'm i'm so sorry i didn't know i'm new oh that's okay no problem all right, thanks. Or even even in the like, knife fight, he's literally yeah. trying not to fight. He's like, I don't want to do yeah. this. Leave me alone. And it's only until they call him Marty McFly. I mean, excuse me, until they call him Chicken, <laughs> that he he finally snaps out and is like, No, fuck yeah. you! Don't call me Chicken, asshole! I'm gonna stab you. But that's what I'm saying. Is the- Chicken still effective? Is a is a question. But no, what were you no, going to say? I was just saying that school insignia moment. I think is so important because unlike Buzz or his parents, or anybody who's, like, a real dick to him. The guy just goes, hey, don't stand on that. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know. And instead of going, yeah, well, you should know, the guy just goes, oh, yeah, no big deal. And then Jim goes, all right. And that's it. And you realize, like, oh, there's so much conflict in this movie that could have been avoided if people just talked to Jim as a person instead of immediately hitting him with adversity. Jim tries to fit in by, you know, making a little joke mooing during a, you know, during the little laser light show they go to in the in the planetarium. No, and if- he fucked up. You're 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 wrong. He fucked <laughs> up. That moo set off a chain of events that would drastically change that town <laughs> and a lot of people that lived in it. Could he have could he have done it better? Are you saying it was a poor moo? What what joke would you Okay. That's my question. I would have done a different barn animal. I would have picked like, I would have done crab and I would have went, but I guess another guy did a crab joke. Yeah. So it's like, you can't step on that. But I don't, and I don't, I don't know. There's a goat, right? In horoscopes. I think so. Yeah. Well, constellations. I'm trying to think of other animals, but anyway, I think it was just, it was a misfire (laughs) for sure. So it's so you're saying it's all it's all the fault of that failed joke. That's where this is all. Yeah. Going. So this yeah. whole movie, yeah. the the entire theme of this movie is the dangers of improv. <laughs> yeah. This is what happens when people that shouldn't be improving improv. Especially Teens if you're new die. in town, you know, and you and you rely on your improv skills, <laughs> and then see what happens. <laughs> I, I do think it's worth pointing out, by the way, at the observatory, another thing that I love, that moment where Natalie, I mean, I, I think, you know, Natalie Wood's performance in this movie just floors me every time. Like, the amount of when Buzz punctures Jim's tire, and they cut to her reaction, and it's like, in five seconds, she's nervous, she's bothered, she's concerned, she's also, like, sexually charged by this whole act. Like, there's a lot going on there. But then later, when she's talking to, or a little later, she's talking to Plato. Uh, and she's like, "Oh, do you know Jim?" And Plato just starts making up facts about Jim, which I love. When he's just like, "Oh yeah, his name's James, but uh, you know he's, he's called Jim." You know, and and if you're a real good friend, you we're know, best friends. Jamie. Yeah, like that is such an interesting. I I just love that little moment. Yeah, honestly, with with like the scene like that, and starting off with, "Oh, so you're just like killing dogs for fun, huh?" And the very closeted nature of of yeah. Plato, I honestly thought like he was gonna snap out at the end and try to kill Jim, which is kind of what happens, but also not. But also, just got to the notes that that's kind of what the ending was gonna be, where he Plato was oh. going to shoot Jim and then blow himself up with a grenade. <laughs> Holy shit! <laughs> which is but, like, but... I mean, come on! Every time you can add a grenade to the end of a movie, <laughs> I think you kind of have to. I hang mean, on, also, hang I, on, I think on. Ben. Thoughts on grenades in movies? I know you've got grenades chains. in movies. Yeah. What? What do you? What? Do you, yeah. Where's your grenade take? My grenade take. Um, in cartoons, mm-hmm. they're always like really fun. Like there's so many great grenade bits. Mm-hmm. And I will say that to to end a movie where a character a grenade is dropped and they look at the camera and then there's an explosion and it just ends. That might. Be maybe one of the best way to end a movie. 
<laughs> on that note, I wanna, I'm want i going to give you a sec to think of your answer, Ben, but I'm going to pose a question to you, and I'm sorry for putting you on the spot. No, it's okay. If you, you get to pick one movie you have covered on blank check, and you get to change mm-hmm. the ending, so now it ends with a character dropping a grenade and then looking into the camera concerned and then blowing up, what movie do you okay. change the ending of? Wow. And who who um, is the one that uh, Wiley Coyote style gets blown up by the grenade, if you want to add that on as well? It's Don John. <laughs> <laughs> Immediately. Because that way I know, I know that the movies resolve the way that I want it to. I actually strongly endorse that selection. That is. Yeah, that's oh, incredible. Just, yep. just. Yep. The obvious, like the only answer, I like think... there's no other options. <laughs> that caught me so off guard in part because I forgot you even did that film, and you had that answer so quick. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he just as far as a character that I'd like to sort of like uh, follow that timeline as far as to grenade, he he came to mind. I can't disagree with you. I've seen that movie. I can't disagree. (laughs) I have a literal tear welling up in one of my eyes now. Oh, my God. Oh, boy. Well, Don John. Um, Yeah, so Plato the Grand. Uh, I think this is a much better ending. Uh, I think it's a much better choice um, for how that went. Uh, But, yes, with Plato, he's he's an odd character. I think the thing with Plato that I think is so interesting, this is, you know, in, in the case of Judy... She's pretty much a, you know, she's a normal teen who just doesn't understand why her dad's rejecting her. In Jim's case, he's a relatively normal teen who just has some, you know, slight uh, anger and anxiety issues. Uh, Plato is a character who actually needs support and help. And, like, his actions are a cry for help. And I think that the one thing that's so interesting about his character is that it flies in kind of the face of what may have been the conventional attitude at the time, which is, you know, like I talked about in those earlier 30s and 40s films, the idea was like every single, you know, it it seemed to approach that like every single problem in society is economic in nature, right? This idea that like, well, if so-and-so had more money, you know, and -and so-and-so had a nice house and -and so-and-so had whatever, they wouldn't be, they wouldn't have any anger issues. They wouldn't have any, you know, they wouldn't have any problems. Like it's purely economic. And I think in the case of Plato, like it flies in the face of all that because Plato, his, his parents give him plenty of money, right? He has a place to live. He has, you know, all of the, the material things. But because he doesn't have any kind of love or support in his life, he's, he's uh, you know, he's an individual that needs support, you know, which I think is a he really is. interesting approach. On the road to becoming a serial killer, yeah, yeah he's oh yeah, like in a like having a crisis, yeah, absolutely. And I think it, I just think it's very important that it's not it's it's not that he comes from a quote unquote uh, a broken home or a poor home. It's just like it's no, this guy needs support. Like it's it's keeping the emotional and psychological elements in this conversation rather than something like a dead end where it's just, well, you know, if they'd only had a dime, you know, which I think is such a, an interesting approach to take. It's ra- it's almost the opposite. I mean, you know, we are in the, I mean, Tom and I can say, I mean, I'm sure Ben, you're from Jersey. So you've, you've, you know, this as well. Um, and, and we're from Long Island. So this is true here too, which is uh, the young pe- the, the, the young people who have a lot of their parents' money are certainly not the most uh, stable and put together, you know? No, no they're, definitely not. They're just the no, ones who, not. yeah, they're just the ones who can afford the cocaine. Like that's the only difference, really. You know, <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Um, which you know, I, it's, did, I just think it's important to you know note. That. I mean, it's you know. it's not too dissimilar, honestly, from like what the what's going on in the other James Dean movie, East of Eden, which is like, yeah. do you you don't know what it's like to not be loved? It's the most painful thing in the world. Which is just that's basically what's happening with Plato, and. I mean, not really with Jim and Judy, but like, well, Judy, you see it in Plato. I mean, Judy, uh, Judy is is literally being denied love. You know, she's being denied love, but in the like, 
Yeah. All right. So base it's it's not it's pretty much the same. Like you're just seeing yeah. what happens to people when they're not loved, and Plato's is the most extreme because he is the one that doesn't even have anybody that he could kind of delude himself into thinking still cares about him or is there to do the right thing. He there he's got nobody, and you know it's kind of not a surprise to see this kid go the way he goes. Um. Yeah, I mean, it's just fucking sad. It's just a sad, sad movie. Like, I wasn't expecting that watching it the first time. And even the ending, I think one thing that's poignant and sticks out to me this time, because Nicholas Ray is very good at, at subtlety and conveying things, is that this ending on this film, this ending features seemingly, I mean, you have that moment where, like Tom, you mentioned, uh, Jim's parents smile at each other for the first time, right? Yeah. But Ray is very pointed in the fact that he cuts from, oh, mom, dad, this is Judy. She's my friend. Uh, and they walk off. And then Jim's parents smile at each other, right? And then we cut to, uh, we cut to uh, Marietta Canty, who's the, the family maid for Plato, right? The, his, 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 his caregiver. The, yeah. the one black woman in this movie and she's just standing there sobbing because her essentially surrogate child is dead yeah. and we cut from Nicholas Ray you know we cut from like happy family to that which I think is very deliberate on Ray's part you know to kind of convey like oh I'm showing you the Hollywood happy ending in a way of like all oh, the parents are resolved but this woman's life is ruined yeah. this is... there's also these are the consequences as well yeah I, I think it's also the fact that if you look at that overhead shot at the end, Jim and Judy and his parents get to walk away and Marietta is just walking forward towards this body, you know, like that's, yep. I, I think it's very striking and very deliberate what Ray's doing with that ending, you know. Did anybody else have anything they wanted to add about the film itself before uh, we wrap up talking about the? Uh, we always wrap, Ben. You know, we always wrap up talking about how the films did at the Oscars. Did anybody else have anything they wanted to add before that? Uh, I think I'm good. Uh, okay. Yes, I have please. one. One. Okay. Two things. No, fine. please Quickly. take as much the time as you jacket, want. The red jacket. Yeah. That iconic red jacket. Uh, I believe a shot is the brand. S C H O T T classic new york city company has been around forever makes amazing leather jackets motorcycle jackets truly like the quintessential motorcycle jacket that you can own mm -hmm. i own one um yeah the red jacket is i think a primo yeah having shopped there in the past they definitely promote the fact that he wore one of their jackets in this movie and it's it's worth noting you know you mentioned that but i should point out i have this book um that i i read sometimes called the films that changed my life where they talk to different directors about uh the movies that influenced them uh john woo uh picks rebel without a cause as like the movie that inspired him alongside mean streets and he talks about when he was a young man growing up in hong kong uh after seeing this movie he went out and got the same kind of red leather jacket for himself and slicked his hair back and wandered around trying to look like James Dean. So it's an absolutely it's iconic the uniform. Look, absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's like the thing when you're starting to figure who you are out and, you know, you're rebelling, having that moment. You reach for the things and it's Doc Martens and it's motorcycle jacket and, you know, tight black jeans, what? et cetera, et cetera. I, I now okay. Ben, I don't know what you mean. Tom, I never I never wore a leather jacket back in the day, right? It wasn't uh constant and <laughs> on me at all times as a young man. You're gonna have to talk to my reps about this one. I uh I may have uh graduated college in a leather jacket. That may have been a thing I decided to do. Incredible. Under I, I like that was a wise decision. <laughs> underneath my robe, underneath like the black robe, you can see the the wrist of the leather jacket poking out. So yeah. yeah. Here's the real question. Did you have a fedora face? No. Um, I mean, I, I guess I had a fedora insofar as, like, there was... It wasn't a phase. I had a brown fedora that occasionally, if I was wearing... Uh, I used to have, like, the tweed jacket, 
hoodie, um, fingerless gloves, like Lewin Davis thing that I would do from time to time. And that I think I would bust out the fedora for, but I was not a frequent fedora guy. I don't look good. It just took a roundabout way to say yes. No, because it wasn't like a phase because I didn't wear it much. I just, um, I, I like occasionally with one particular outfit, but no, because I look, I look stupid in all hats. I cannot wear hats. It's like you, you know, you just occasionally listen to Smash Mouth. You just <laughs> sometimes wore a fedora. <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> no, I, I, I look, I look terrible in every hat. That's my problem. I cannot wear hats. I have a big stupid head. Uh, sorry, Ben. What was your other point? Okay, so. Dean's physicality mm-hmm. and it's very groundbreaking, right? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. it's like his fluid performance, his motion, his movement. But it and it's like, you know, we're talking throughout this episode, like the quintessential cool, yeah. the sort of the legacy of like how do you how one carries themselves, how they talk. Um and the thing about it that was kind of making me laugh is he is so constantly drooped like like um almost in a dramatic way where i was like this is rudd and wet hot like (laughs) yes kind like kind of like where i'm like paul rudd nailed it like (laughs) he in this movie so much of it is him lying around and kind of leaning in this like i don't really care way that yeah it it just it was like i was really i was laughing uh throughout because there's so many poses that he's put into well and of course there's that famous deleted scene where uh dean kisses natalie wood and then says you taste like burgers i don't want you anymore right am i I (laughs) Um, (laughs) no i mean you talk about the fluidity of dean's movements i think the best example of that and i not to bring up i'll bring up a film that we uh, I can guarantee we'll never get to cover on this podcast, which is, of course, the most fam- one of the most famous lines from this movie gets lifted for Tommy Wiseau's The Room, um, which is that moment where when Dean's parents are fighting and he yells, you know, uh, you're tearing me apart. Uh, you, Tommy Wiseau lifts that in The Room for you're tearing me apart, Lisa. But the thing that's so interesting is when Wiseau does it, who is not a particularly skilled actor, his movements are so stiff and jagged, it gets made fun of all the time. That you're tearing me apart, Lisa. Will you look at what Dean's doing? That line reading should be ridiculous, and I think anybody else might make it ridiculous. But because of the way he he moves and cringes as he says it, and the the way his voice rises and falls, it feels so organic. It feels like it's coming from the you know from the gut. Like it's one of those moments that if somebody told you, oh, he improvised that on the set, you'd buy it because it feels so raw. There's a I mean, rawness looks, to what he's doing. He he looks like he wants to crawl out of his own skin the entire movie. He feels like a kid yeah. that just yeah. doesn't know anything about himself. That is just all weird movements and just just emotional outbursts. And he's just like he's like two or three years away from like coming coming into his body, and he's still just this lurching little weirdo. Even though he looks like James Dean, he's still just like just everything about him is just. Uh, crank to 11 and he can't control himself so real robert pattinson energy if we're calling it like it is like very yes Mm. even though james dean looks exactly like channing tatum yep also fair um you know i should say one other thing we should mention uh before we wrap up the Oscars, which is of course we should acknowledge that uh the core trio of this film all uh meet tragic and untimely ends which is a thing that kind of hangs over this movie the whole time you're watching it i think at least for me and and for people like you know that yeah. that here you have this trio of people who their characters are all acting like you know they could die at any moment and, and um obviously uh salminio who um i think probably i i i love salminio but he you know he probably uh, maybe had the the roughest career after this in terms of like you know, he had, uh, what is it? He did, after this movie comes out, Minio does like a ton of juvenile delinquent type rock and roller movies. Like he gets kind of typecast for a while. He's in Crime in the Streets, Rock Pretty Baby, Dino, The Young Don't Cry. Um, and then in 58, he is in uh, Walt Disney's Tonka, where he plays a Native American. Because uh, in the 50s, uh, if you were Italian, you just played any ethnicity. Remember that? Remember how, yeah. uh, you know, 
half of the cast of Lawrence of Arabia is is just Italian guys at certain points. Um, in any event, uh, so he, you know he has, but then obviously, uh, decades, you know, or like a, I think a decade later, he's murdered. Um, his last he film dies in seventy three. Yeah, because his last theatrical film is Escape from the Planet of the Apes, and then yeah, he, he is he is murdered in nineteen seventy three. Uh, Natalie yeah. Wood's death has been uh, highly publicized uh, at the age of 43. And then Dean, like I said, did not live to see this film come out. He uh, he has a car accident in 1955 in the, um, in the Porsche Spider, I believe, is the car. Um, has the car accident. And ironically, do you guys know the last thing James Dean ever filmed? What was that? No. It was a uh, Drive Safely ad. They used to do these PSAs, mm. um, and they would always end with like them telling people, buckle up and drive safe. And the line that they would always say at the end was, uh, the life you save could be your own. But in this case, Dean was on the set of Giant. Uh, and so he's got his, like, and, and the young part of Giant. So he's got his kind of cowboy outfit on. They're on a ranch. And they tell him, like, oh, James, do you have anything to say to the young kids? And it's kind of just him going, "Ah, buckle up and be safe on the road. But he decided to riff on the last line. And I I remember seeing this, and it just stuck with me, because he looks straight into camera, and he goes, you know, stay safe. The life you save (laughs) could be mine. And then walks off. It is haunting. It's an upsetting thing to see. So, yes, uh, Dean would uh, obviously... And then this comes out, you know, a month after he dies. Giant comes out the next year. Uh, and as we'll get into, uh, he received some posthumous uh, recognition for that. Did anybody else have anything they want to add first? Well, I just think yeah. it would have been weird if he looked at the camera and then he just started talking about his tables. <laughs> his tables? It's a reference to I Think You Should Leave Season 2. There we Okay. Okay. Thank you. That took me. You're welcome. Took me. It took me a minute. I was like, "What?" No, it was I'm stupid. And I movie. didn't need to say it, but That's... I just pretty much any time <laughs> I could talk about that show and the, specifically that sketch with Patty Harrison, I just have to. So now, I see. That's where you're going because when you said "look into camera" and I think you should leave, I went to cough and flop. But no, that absolutely makes sense. That he's mm. got to get to. <laughs> got to get these tables to Freddy Krueger. My tables. Why was she? Why was she asking about the tables? I told you not to ask about that. Um. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, all right. <laughs> so, Rebel Without a Cause was not nominated for Best Picture that year. Uh, the nominees for Best Picture were Love Is a Many Splendored Thing, Mister Roberts, Picnic, The Rose Tattoo, and the winner, Marty. Now, I'll say this for my money: Rebel Without a Cause should absolutely be in over Love Is a Many Splendored Thing or The Rose Tattoo. But Marty is an exceptional film. Uh, I, have either of you guys seen Marty? No, I haven't yet. Ben, I, I don't mean to step on you know your blank check host's toes when they say that's a major Ben movie. But I dare say Marty feels like a Ben movie. It's just Ernest Borgnine. Mm-hmm. He plays a, a, a fat 34-year-old butcher in the Bronx who feels nobody's ever going to love him. He meets a, a homely school teacher. They fall for each other. His friends go, nah, that dame's too ugly. And he goes, nah, but I like her. Credits. Wow. Take it out. It's like, it is it is the only 90-minute best picture winner. be a winner. country it's, where you can make a Marty. That movie won the Palme d'Or and then best picture. It is one of only That's two insane. movies to ever do that. What? That and That's Parasite. That's crazy. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Marty fucking rules. I love that movie dearly. Um... Dean was posthumously nominated for Best Actor, but he was nominated for East of Eden rather than Rebel Without a Cause. East of Eden and Rebel Without a Cause come out the same year, and East of Eden was definitely viewed as the more prestige picture of the two. So Dean does get posthumously nominated for East of Eden. Uh, Rebel Without a Cause would get nominations for Best Supporting Actor for Sal Mineo, who loses to Jack Lemmon and Mr. Roberts. Uh, It gets a Best Supporting Actress nomination for Natalie Wood, who loses to Joe Van Fleet in East of Eden, uh, and then is nominated for Best Motion Picture Story, but loses to Love Me or Leave Me. Uh, and as I noted, Rebel Without a Cause comes out uh, the same year as East of Eden and the same year as Blackboard Jungle, another Oscar-nominated juvenile delinquent movie. So, 
uh, an interesting year. It is I I one of those cases where uh, I think it was not taken. I mean, it does get nominated for things, but I don't think this film was taken as seriously when it came out as it subsequently would. Uh, as noted by the fact that Dean gets nominated for East of Eden rather than Rebel. Dean would also get nominated the next year for uh, Giant. Uh, I think he remains the only actor to receive two posthumous Oscar nominations. Ben, thank you so much for joining us. We really yeah, appreciate man. you coming on for this. This was this was a blast. Thank you so much. Yeah, I had fun. This, this was great. Thank you for letting me uh, talk about this hugely influential movie. I feel like we obviously could probably talk for hours and hours more about all the different specifics and tangents of this movie, but I feel like we covered a lot. And I'm glad I got to talk about Huffing. I feel like that was an important thing. That <laughs> I'm very glad you got to there. talk about it. Yeah, I'm very yeah, glad. Thank you. And uh, do you have anything you want to plug before you go? Um, I mean, we've talked about it enough, but just, you know, I'll just say check out Blank Check if you don't already. And um, I guess I'll just plug, you know, stay tuned. I'm, I'm, you know, I keep picking it up. I put down the screenplay. I pick it up. I put it back <laughs> down. But someday... My opus, Night Eggs, stay, you know, it'll, it'll, I mean, I don't even need to pitch it. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's like, I, I send the PDF off. It's go time, baby. So, you know, let's say Night Eggs, if it's 22, yes, Night Eggs, 20, 25. Uh, don't go to your local theater. They don't exist anymore. <laughs> uh <laughs> <laughs> just uh throw on your old uh headset you know your 3d <laughs> headset and uh go view it in the, your the virtual the metaverse theater. yeah the yeah exactly. pay for it and pay for it and um i don't know bitcoin's all been hacked now so i don't know but use use right. monkey gifs or monkey pdfs or jpegs or whatever they are uh you know you pay pay for pay for your night eggs ticket entirely use some other kind of ironic yeah. currency that's <laughs> like dogecoin or some shit <laughs> What pay for it in chip coins? That's available in your store, right? That's a that's a form go. of currency. Yes. Uh, do you have any yes. social media you want to plug, or do you want people to leave you alone? You know, either way. No, yeah, you know, I never do it, but I sometimes do. Uh, Twitter at Ben Hosley H O S L E Y, and um, yeah, that's really it as far as socials. Great, and Ben, obviously, uh, thank you for coming on. You're also welcome back. You know, in a, in a future season, either if there's another scumbum film that interests you, or if you want to go the exact mm -hmm. opposite direction. If you're like, hey, man, let's do Mary Pickford's 1920 something poor little rich girl. I mean, you know, whatever, we'll make it work. You know, whatever strikes your fancy. I love that. Yeah, maybe what we do is the opposite. It's like I'll pick a movie that like you couldn't put in the Library of Congress. Like it would be illegal. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> like it's not even allowed. Like in t like 20 feet, you know, like I, you can't even get near the building. I I gotta tell you, I I think that's half of the things Tom picks for the registry in our show. Sometimes <laughs> is that they would just look at and go, "I'm sorry, what is this?" Uh, <laughs> uh, and I'm, yeah, thank you. And on that note, uh, everybody else, stick around because we'll be right back with our picks for the National Film Registry. The National Film Registry isn't some fixed object, frozen in time. It's always growing, adding new titles every year. These annual selections are made by the National Film Preservation Board, with members like Martin Scorsese, Alfre Woodard, and Leonard Maltin, and representatives from organizations like the Academy, the DGA, and the AFI coming together to debate and decide. But they don't just pull titles out of thin air. They pull from the public, people like you and us, who can submit their nominations for the registry in a form on the Library of Congress's website. What we do, at the end of each episode, is have Mike and Tom pick films not yet in the registry that they feel should be, inspired by that day's topic. At the end of each season, those films will be formally submitted to the National Film Registry for consideration, on behalf of your missing out. Here are today's picks. So my pick, I was thinking about, you know, the legacy of Rebel Without a Cause, because we talked about uh, this is obviously in the DNA of every film that comes out afterward. Not just the juvenile delinquent films of the 50s and 60s, but teen films. And, and the teen films and the teen dramas that we have decades and decades afterward. And anything to deal with teens and crime or anything like that and, and, and the anxieties and struggles of young folks. And I was also thinking about uh, the fact that Rebel Without a Cause is the iconic role 
of a star who died too soon, right? And a, a person who, and a, and a star who now is more than just, uh, like Ben noted, he's more than just a, a, a movie star. You don't even have to know his movies. You don't even have to know anything about what he did. You just know that image. He's an icon. And at that point, it became kind of obvious to me because there is another um, great film that has now entered the pop culture lexicon in the same way. Images from it are iconic. And it also deals with the, uh, you know, young kids getting into trouble and also stars um, and a, a remarkable iconic talent who died too soon. Um, my pick for the registry is Ernest Dickerson's 1992 film Juice. Um, for folks who haven't seen Juice, it stars Omar Epps, Jermaine Hopkins, Khalil Kane, and significantly um, is the best film role, most memorable film role of Tupac Shakur. Um, Tupac plays this incredibly menacing uh, villain in the film, Roland Bishop. And I would argue that I think in today's society, or at least maybe for people our age and a little uh, younger, like that image of Roland leaning against the lockers is akin to that James Dean pose uh, with his leg crossed from the Rebel Without a Cause poster, right? It, it's an iconic image. Um, Ernest Dickerson is a, a, is a very gifted filmmaker uh, in, in many regards, and I think that he's a guy who will pro- I, I think if he isn't already getting a reappraisal is probably overdue for a reappraisal, you know, not saying anybody's going to sit down and go, ah, never die alone is, is, uh, you know, uh, one of the great works of our time, but he's, he's definitely better than he gets credit for. And, and juice is, I think his best film really just a, a well-made tense and stirring comes out of that time of a lot of those films, like a boys in the hood and a straight out of Brooklyn. But I think, um, was too often compared to those in its day. Now time has kind of shown it as a much more distinct and uh, unique film. So uh, Juice, I would like 1992's Juice to be in the National Film Registry. Okay, so for me, I think the connection to these two is pretty clear um, in terms of the story it's telling, the look of the movie. I think the filmmaker I'm about to discuss was very purposefully thinking of uh, Rebel uh, Without a Cause when filming this movie, and it's very lush, old school, Technicolor way. Um, and when you talk about a cast, I mean, I don't think you're going to be able to make an argument in this decade for a movie that has a better cast or is better at or was better at picking young stars out from the ether and throwing them into this stew and then seeing where they went after that. Um, thematically, I think a lot of it's the same. My pick is um, the outsiders, the look of it straight up rebel without a cause, the themes of it about these young kids with no adults to really make life easy for them or to give them any love, leaving them to fend for themselves in the midst of all these raging hormones and everything. And that fucking cast, I mean, I don't necessarily know if anyone in this movie had their James Dean moment in this movie, but C. Thomas Howell, Ralph Macchio, Diane Lane, Matt Dillon, Patrick Swayze, Tom Cruise, Rob Lowe, fucking uh, Emilio Estevez, uh, you know, you just look at that collection. That is like the 80s. It rolled into one. And while one person may not have had the James Dean moment in that movie, the way James Dean had in Rebel Without a Cause. I mean, just the collective power of what Coppola was able to do casting that movie is astounding. I think it's still one of the best movies from the 80s, one of the best movies about kids, about being an, you know, uh, <laughs> an outsider and being just having to fend for yourself and just all of those emotions that come through about family and everything. I think The Outsiders is a pretty powerful fl flick, and I think it's a perfect companion to Rebel Without a Cause. Let's all go to the lobby, lobby, lobby. Thank you again to Ben Hosley for joining us. Next week, we look at one of the most iconic satires about Hollywood. Maynard Bangs from the Reels of Justice podcast joins us for Sullivan's Travels. Don't forget to follow the show wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks again for listening. 
and we'll see you again next time. Here on You're Missing Out. They honor movies of historical, cultural, or aesthetic importance on the National Film Registry.